locating and pitching strikes. And he opens the game with strike one, working to Dylan Campbell. 6'3", 195-pound right-hander, again, out of the Toronto area. And delivering the balls today to Chris Kosky, who will make the balls and strikes call behind home plate. And we're underway from the Little Apple. Hope you enjoyed here with you in the next three days for a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Most of the Big 12 going to this Thursday, Friday, Saturday arrangement with Easter Sunday on the horizon. Hassel working quickly here in the early going. He was magical last week down at Texas Tech, but ended up a no decision in that game. Five and a third allowed just three hits to that red hot Texas Tech offense. That was his best outing of the year and and really controlled the, uh, the the strike zone very well mixed his pitches really well 86 pass Campbell for strikeout number one we're off one running and now time for the keys to victory Mike Clark what do you have for these two teams well, Texas's offense is just loaded so next up and then the pitchers particularly tonight great pitcher challenge the Kansas State hitters challenge them they they've done a great job on the hitting part for Kansas State no place like home we talked about the numbers and then Dylan Hassel and the uh, uh, K-State uh, or Griffin Hassel and the K-State pitchers have to keep the ball down this is a dynamic middle of the order the home runs uh, they've got 50 or 15 more home runs than we do or than Kansas State does and uh, that's all right uh, yeah I'm struggling right now <laughs> as you well know Brian it's heck to get old getting the uh, thanks I think that is also a, an admonishment or an acknowledgement of the fact that I, I too am aging quickly it is uh, as you said keep it at the knees right keep that, it at the knees now, that's important it, it got to keep it down and they have three hitters that have hit 10 or more home runs. And uh, which is in this game, I mean, we're only 30 plus games into the season that you project that out over to a major league season. That is a serious I mean, one every three games. You're getting it done. Boy, talk about getting it done. Griffin Hassel again looking sharp to open it up. And, and the thing about Griffin is, is that he, he he mixes. He has four pitches that he can throw for strikes. He can move it up, down, in and out. And when he's under control, he really forces the other team. They, they, they're used to Friday night seeing 95, 94, 93 mile an hour. They're seeing 86, 87. It's a little different. It looks very hittable, but it isn't because of the location of the pitches. Hassel was actually the first recruit in the history of the Pete Hughes era here at K-State. Buck Taylor, the pitching coach of the Wildcats, as well, identifying Hassel early on. It's that one past Melendez, and it's 0-2 to the slugging first baseman of the Longhorns. And Hassel now in his fourth year of the program. Of course, one of those years was the COVID season of 2020, but a former All-Big 12 freshman team member. Melendez the batter one of those guys that we talked about that Mike just mentioned that has over 10 home runs 16 to lead college baseball. And we'll foul that one back. And with being able to get the other pitches away the breaking pitch a change up that 88 mile an hour fastball in can get in even with a good power hitter that can get inside and, and uh, foul it off. Three up. Going to see a really good changeup. I mean, great movement on the fastball, a nice breaking pitch, but the changeup is is the eye-opening pitch. Uh, not quite as good as Jordan Wicks's changeup, but it's a really, really good pitch. Sitting on the fastball there, Nikolov rips it in the left field, and the Cats open up with a base hit. So part of the thinking process as well, Mike, for Nikolov was ahead of Dylan Phillips, ahead of Dom Johnson. He might see a lot of fastballs. Nikolov, very talented hitter. And, and with Hanson being in the strike zone a lot, the Cats are going to get good pitches to hit. They're also going to get bad pitches to hit that are in the zone that will be double play, ground ball, pop-up set. And they have to differentiate the difference between the two. But they will get pitches in the zone. They just need to approach it correctly in order to hit it to the right field. So a good start to begin for K-State. And now here's Dom Johnson, who's been one of the Big 12's best when it comes to mid on base, hitting over 600 with runners in scoring position. 
or 560, close to it. There you see those numbers I was talking about. 435 with runners on base, third best of the Big 12. What a revelation he has been coming from Oklahoma State. After the first two, and down to the count, 0-2. Hanson came in with a slider inside under his hands, and Johnson was able to foul it off. Texas is not really playing Johnson to pull that much. Most teams really play Johnson to pull. He has a lot of balls down the left field line. That one down, gets away from the catcher. Taking off is Johnson, but he'll be asked to go back to home play. But Nikoloff does advance to second base on the wild pitch. So while it is a strikeout for Dom Johnson, the first out of the inning, it is an advancement for Nikoloff into scoring position. Another slider down in the dirt, and Johnson just couldn't lay off, a little too aggressive. But the Wildcats have a runner in scoring position. For Dylan Phillips, the all-time home run leader in K-State history. Got that record here at home, the last home stand. Now at nine on the season to lead K-State, and he'll take a low strike. The only left-hander in the lineup for each team today is Dylan Phillips. He'll go the other way and slash this one foul. The wind today, always a topic here at Toyton Family Stadium. Today, the wind blowing out towards right field and right center field. That's the pull side for Phillips. But it's a good wind if you're a lefty on the mound because there won't be many trying to go that way on a pull pitch. It, it's not as strong as it has been after driving in western Kansas Tuesday with the 50 mile an hour winds. This is really kind of calm. Off speed pitch gets Phillips so back to back strikeouts after that lead off base hit. And Hanson looking every bit the part. Started that slider on the outside part of the plate and then broke it down and away. Phillips who has hit left handers pretty well this year to the tune of near 360. Is out on that one, and now it'll be up to Nick Goodwin to pick up K State with a two out RBI. He has 10 of his 28 RBIs this year with two outs. And second best on the team, and he'll swing and miss at the off speed from Hansen. So, not too many fastballs from Hansen after that early one knocked around by Nikolov. A lot of sliders, a lot of off speed pitches. Not quite the prototypical Friday night guy for Texas that you would hear about and see over the years. But the results are very much. Really good. Yep. Well, they say if it works, if you find a pitch that works, just keep throwing the thing. And, and that's what he's been doing. He's, that slider has been nasty. Great break. Not just a, a cross, but it's also changing plane, also down. Makes it really tough to follow. So. Wildcats are just a little too aggressive. Both, both, both of those pitches were out of the zone. One and two to Goodwin. Tried to backdoor that one and wasn't able to get it. Goodwin, a 371 hitter with runners in scoring position. So even though with two outs facing the tough Ace of the Texas staff. He has been a guy that's come through in clutch moments. Went for that low one again, and Goodwin is throwing strikes. Aoka Lee, the All-American center for you throughout the first pitch tonight, being honored as the Big 12 Scholar Athlete of the Year. Congratulations to her on that honor, yet another in her trophy case. But she threw a perfect strike. So was that -talented. all coaching, right? I mean, you taught her how to pitch as well, apparently. I No, I did not, and uh, I did not. I did tell her to go from the stretch, though. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, that worked out because she threw it very, very well as Staley gets the hit to lead off the inning. Let's see if we she can... didn't know what that was. But she the didn't way. understand. Here, here it is right here. Yeah, yeah look at that yeah. right there. Listen, there have been 
tons of people that have more baseball background than Yoki that have not come close yes. to hitting the plate with a strike. So impressive yet again. From I had games like that. So. <laughs> The, uh, I know this time of year, we're done with basketball, but the work never stops for you guys. It's always continuing on, recruiting in the, the portal, all that sort of stuff. I, I guess just from, from the casual observer, how busy are you guys during this time of year, even though you're not actually in season coaching basketball games? Yeah, probably uh, probably busier than, than, you know, the change obviously is a portal. There's 1,170 kids in the portal. So uh, virtually every <laughs> night you're, you're talking to players or you're talking to somebody. And we've got a couple spots right now. Whether we fill them or not, we'll see. But um, we've got a couple spots. So we're certainly going to look at every avenue we can to improve our roster. I know that you've been out to a couple of games in the past when you can, uh, college baseball games. How much do you use other sports for recruiting uh, when you come and yeah. have people take visits well certainly you know baseball you know you've got half our team here tonight and our, our team loves to come to the games and uh, this is such a great ballpark so you know weather will play a factor as it always does in these games but uh, you, you know you get some good weather around here um, this is a great place to watch uh, watch baseball game and uh, certainly uh, I love to watch it when I can now as I mentioned you played now you guys you get you guys being Mike and Jeff. You guys have a Missouri Western tie, if I remember this right. Uh, you were both coaching at the same time, or did you play at the time that he was there? What was what's the connection? Uh, it was after, but uh, uh, I played for Coach Menace, who <laughs> there's a, a great history with Coach with Coach Menace. Yeah, I love him. Yeah, we both pitched for Coach Menace. So okay, and and. Uh, I'm sure that isn't on any, you know, <laughs> any's resume or, <laughs> or anything. He's I mean, not bragging about it is what well, you're saying? Well, no, but, he, I mean, we both had a great experience. Coach Menace was awesome, and, and our experience at Missouri Western was, was key to us being where we're at today, actually, because we both were graduate assistants then after we played baseball. Yep. I actually did women's basketball for one year as a yeah, graduate assistant go. and baseball, so careers Which, went a little different. That's right. Which you did as well, right? You got roped into doing basketball. That's how you got I started. Did. I did. I, I, I did both. And, and you know, we, this was always uh, – when coach was here, this was kind of always the first game for Missouri Western. Yep. A lot of times, I yep. I pitched here and uh, wind blown homer to right. On, 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 <laughs> it, it, I'm uh, stunned. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure it was wind blown. Yeah, it, right. It, it uh, probably wouldn't have hit the building if it wasn't for the wind. <laughs> I think there is a dent still. Up. Yeah, right. It probably no, is. No, I still no. have vivid memories of that. Um, I think, but we've had you on before. We showed some of those pictures of you pitching in the past, mm -hmm. uh, firing yeah. it in as a Missouri Western Griffin. Golden Griffin. Golden, golden Griffin. Griffin. Don't want to forget the golden part. <laughs> well, That's the, the uh, obviously the, the, the basketball season this last year was fantastic for you guys. The Yoki had a tremendous season. The 61-point game got a lot of headlines, banking it back to the NCAA tournament. Is uh, Cole Johnson up to play that one on the hop? Texas two on here with nobody out in the second. But uh, obviously looking for more. You've already added. We announced Gabby Gregory coming in from Oklahoma. Uh, how excited are you for, for next year for what you'll see on the court? Yeah, really excited about our returning group. But also felt like, you know, we did not shoot the ball well at all. We did not go to the free throw line enough. And you mentioned Gabby Gregory. Those are two areas where she excels in. Two years ago, she went before she had some injuries this year. But she went 131 times two years ago. Uh, shot over 35% from three. So she really improved some of our weaknesses right away. And the number of players you have returning. I mean, practically the whole team is, is back as far as minutes are concerned. We've got a good group back. There's no doubt. We just, um, you know, I, I'd like to, our depth on the front line's got to get better still. Um, and then shooting the basketball, you know, when you have a player like Lee, you've got to surround him. And I expect our freshmen will shoot it better. They're better shooters, but they, they logged a lot of minutes and did so many great things. But I think they had some tired legs late in the year, and, and we just didn't shoot it very well down the stretch. One of the last things I wanted to talk to you about, too, was we've seen just culturally and societally across the country women's basketball really be in the in the conversation here. As we've seen numbers at its all-time high as far as te television ratings. South Carolina in the championship run, Don Staley has talked a lot about that we saw as Austin Todd puts down a perfectly executed sack bunt to move the runners up. We saw record crowds at Bramlage here down the stretch. K-State ranked to the top four in the, in the Big 12 in attendance. 
uh, the last couple of conference matches there down the stretch. Your take on women's basketball's popularity and how do you capture that and keep it rolling, so to speak, do you think, as a group? I think if you invest in it, I think uh, it, the time is right for people to get excited about it. If you don't invest in it, then it's, it's – and I'm talking everything from – from marketing to uh, appearances, things like Yoki tonight. I think our fans want to see that. I think they want to celebrate Big 12 Scholar Athletes of the Year. And so I think the, the better job, you got to win. You got to win. People don't want to show up and see you lose. And But you got to be ready to celebrate that when you do. Skyler Messingham gets the first runs of the game with an RBI base hit up the middle to drive into. Couldn't agree more on that, by the way. And there was a great hand for Yoki as she threw out the first pitch here tonight. Buck Taylor out to the mound to talk with Griffin Hassu. Nearly caught that pitch coming right back at him right up the box. But now the, the support for women's hoops this year was great to see. And not just for K-State, but across the country. And hopefully we'll see it jump up from here from this point forward. But very excited about next year's team. We didn't even mention some of the freshmen that are coming in. This class is ranked as number 23 in the country for you guys and yeah. your staff that's been able to bring in the freshman core that's coming in. Yeah, you know, our, our, our class had a good year, and, uh, you know, we saw them really progress. Now, how hard they come in and work, uh, those type of things, we'll find out when they get here in the summer. But um, I, I like our group, and I think our group will uh, pass that baton to them, and uh, that culture will be important when they get here. But uh, we're excited about uh, all aspects. Ground ball towards third. No play at second for Culpepper, and the freshman throws a bit high, but it's collared by Dylan Phillips for out number two. Well, I know that you are the recruiting wars or the recruiting life never ends. Say hi to Shanna for us. By the way, how is your wife doing with the good. breast cancer announcement that came during the season? Yeah, good. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, real good, real good. Uh, everything, we've gotten great news, and uh, she's wrapping up uh, radiation treatments, and uh, hopefully we'll have that in the rearview mirror soon, but uh, she's doing well. Uh, it's good to hear great news uh, on Shanna, who is uh, the first lady of not just a women's basketball, but one of the true joys of, of this family, the K-State family. Thanks, Jeff, for coming Thanks, on. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to see you. Jeff Mitty. Women's basketball coach here at K-State joining us here in the booth for this uh, for this inning. Hopefully the Wildcats can shut it down. We saw Ayoka Lee, part of the game, honored as the Big 12 Scholar Athlete of the Year. She becomes yet another women's basketball player to win that one. The last before her was Kayla Goth and Brittany Chambers, who both won that. Hassel with a strike to Faltini, who is the number nine hitter in the lineup. Shortstop for the Longhorns. Difference between the first inning and the second inning is location. Everything's been up here this inning, and, and that's the difference. You've got a great hitting team one through nine. You can't make mistakes in the middle of the plate, and you can't make them belt high. Got to get down on the knees. Well, one and two, so a, a strike away from getting out of this inning. Three singles in this frame for the Longhorns. Sack bun in between. Messinger, the... Former Jayhawk with a big hit to this point. Strike three call. Strikeout number four for Griffin Hassel. And it's his second strikeout of a luck Longhorn looking. Bit of baseball appears. Justin Mitchell to lead things off here in the second for K-State. Two run top of the inning for the Longhorns. Good lead for Starting pitcher Pete Hansen, who's coming off a complete game shutout in his last outing. Former Oklahoma Sooner Justin Mitchell down on the count, one and two. Well, see how the Wildcats answer back. Longhorns getting two here on the top of the city. Yeah, Hansen's worked inside a lot on the right-handed hitters for Kansas State. Been very effective working the fastball in and then the slider underneath the hands. Comes with that off-speed pitch with two strikes. Mitchell does not chase. So he stays true to the scouting report. Only two hits allowed in last week's complete game shutout by Pete Hansen against number 23rd ranked 20, uh, TCU. And he'll strike out Mitchell. And that's four straight strikeouts for Hansen, who struck out 12 in each of his last two starts coming in. And again, not an overpowering fastball, but great location. He's been working in, working the slider a lot, and then comes up and up and out with fastball. And uh, Mitchell just can't catch up with it. 
That'll bring up Cole Johnson for the Wildcats. King State missed his bat in the lineup. Johnson was out with a little bit of an ailment, missed the series down in Lubbock, Texas, but he is hitting 349, which is second best on the K State roster, and about the same number, 348 in Big 12 play. Big swing and a miss by the center fielder, who had been red hot coming into that weekend last weekend before his injury. He was 14 for his last 26 before being sidelined, injured in the midweek before the Texas Tech. Series. It's a big bat to be missing in the lineup. One and two. You really see Hansen with his slider. He's not just putting it in one location. He's starting outside, breaking into the zone. He's starting it in the zone, breaking out of the zone. Really done a nice mix with that slider. And a fastball in the inner half. That's his hardest thrown pitch of the night at 90 miles an hour, and it's another strikeout. So he has struck out five straight since giving up that leadoff single to start the game. That, that, setting up that fastball, it's just almost impossible to hit knee high inside corner when you've looked at three sliders and you got yourself one and two in the count. It just it, it makes it really tough doing a good job of mixing speeds, keeping Kansas State off balance, their timings off, but also location. You're looking up, it's changing, you know, eyesight, uh, and then that breaking pitch which breaks down and away both. It's not just one dimension, it's two dimensional breaking pitch. When a guy like this is hammering that slider, he's misses here 2-0, the first time he's been 2-0 to any batter. Can you sit on the slider? Is it because of where he's locating it, as you're describing? Is it too difficult to just sit there on the breaking pitch? Well, it's not necessarily sit on the breaking pitch, but don't be so early on the fastball that you can make an adjustment on the breaking pitch. If you're just dead red, you're not going to touch that pitch because of the timing and also the break of the ball. Came with a fastball 2-1. Back to the fastball here, but misses in, and Culpepper has worked the first three-ball count of the afternoon and now night. Culpepper, the true freshman for Kansas State. Boy, they're really excited about this young man, one of the top players in the Midwest coming out of high school out of Memphis, Tennessee. Where he was the top prep shortstop in the state. Got a fastball 3-1, but fouled back. And that was a really good cut. Ball was just in enough that he couldn't extend his hands and, and get, the, get the bat, the barrel of the bat on the ball. But uh, great deal. I, I love seeing 3-1 counts and the guys take a rip at it. When they get the fastball, take, take a good swing at it. We'll see if he gets a fastball 3-2. Breaking ball, and he walked it. A rare walk from Hansen, who did not have any control of that breaking pitch. And Culpepper, the freshman, becomes the second runner of the day for Kansas State. It was a great at bat. Got ahead, you know, 2 0, and then was able to foul, out a, a foul off a couple of tough pitches, but uh, really good at bat. And that's what Kansas State has to do. Now they have to take advantage of it. When they do get a base runner, move him, get, you know, get, get a key two out base hit, and uh, take, a, take, uh, take advantage of the opportunities that they have. Jeff Heinrich was not expecting a first pitch fastball, but that's what he got, strike one. Heinrich has seen limited time, a transfer from South Carolina, but has shown a little pop at the plate, especially against left-handed pitching. Making start number seven of the year here tonight in game number 32. Just inside, one and one. Key, the key to Hanson's success right now is that fastball on the inside part of the plate because that's keeping the hitters honest on the breaking pitch. They see that and it's like candy. I'm going to be able to start early and get it and then he follows it up with breaking pitches and we're swinging at those outside of the zone. And that's right there. there. Now that so. would have been a strike had he not swung anyway, but it's one and two. Big looping curveball there. to see if Heinrich would chase. He did not. Second straight inning, even against the ace 
of the Longhorns. The K State has had a runner on with two outs. Let's see if they can this time bring him around. Stranded Nikoloff at second to open up in the bottom of the first. Strike three at the knees. Six strike. Three hits, and one of them with one out in the second brought in two runs. Breaking ball here, shot through the hole between shortstop and third base. Another single for the Longhorn offense. Yeah, that's a curveball that really needs to be out of the zone. That was It was down when it got the home plate, but it was still, for an 0-2 pitch, a little too good. And uh, Campbell did a really nice job pulling it between short and third base. Goodwin was even playing a little bit in the hole, but could not get there to cut that off. Longhorn team that hits 320 on the season, and that carries over even on the road. They hit 314 away from Austin, Texas. So lest you think that this has been a team like K-State that has built up their resume by playing at home. And they have played a lot of games at home. In the 15 games on the road, they have still been pretty good. 32 home runs of their 57 have come away from Austin, Texas. Fish Folk is a big ballpark. The yes, bigger it is. than uh, Toynton here, so. A little harder to hit the home run there, but their home run statistics are very impressive no matter where they're playing. A little bit of an uncharacteristic Texas team from what we remember. A little squibber here back to Hassel will be a de facto sacrifice as it moves the runner up. Hodo is retired. Really good off speed pitch. Got Hodo way out in front and just spun it off the end of the bat. Would hit a little harder, had a chance to turn the double play, but slowly as that ball was, uh, Hassel only had one play, and that was the first base. As I said, it acted almost like a sacrifice bunt. Normally, that's what you think of when you think of Texas. At least in the years past, Augie Garrido, the legend that was leading the Longhorn program, that was what Texas baseball was. David Pierce has changed that completely. What a job he has done. National Coach of the Year, Big 12 Coach of the Year, here in his tenure already, two-time Conference Coach of the Year, as a matter of fact, at Texas. Melendez tried to check his swing, but he went around. Yeah, the good old days with Gus Ball and Augie Ball, it was pitching and moving runners and small ball, and this offense is, you know, on octane. <laughs> they can... <laughs> They can swing the bats. This guy at the plate, if you haven't seen it, Ivan Melendez, who describes himself as the nickname Hispanic Titanic, hit one over the train at Minute Maid Stadium in Houston, Texas, when they played a game there. Now, I, and everyone's going to say, well, they got to play with aluminum bats. Now, the bats are different. They are not the same as the old aluminum bats. you got to hit it right to hit it far, and that guy hit it close to 500 feet. Yeah. No, that's very impressive. That's pool holes. Type yeah. Stuff. Well, pool holes in his prime, right? Which yeah. was like 30 years ago. Well, he'll be doing it again with the cards. <laughs> Pickoff play to second, and just in was Campbell. It was a good move. Had it set up well, and with Nikolov playing right behind the base, was able to break in. Bang, bang play. <laughs> See, Campbell was not expecting that. Normally, those runners, they'll, as you said, they'll hear the footsteps, right? Yep. Of a guy running to second base. Popped up by Melendez. Not high enough to be too much of an issue with the win today, so Mitchell will take care of that in fair, fair, fair territory and two outs. Tip your cap to Mitchell because that is not an easy play for the catcher. And when the ball goes up, it's going to spin back toward the infield. So that ball is actually moving away from him as he's standing there. Didn't have time to cut, turn around and square up. Wasn't that high. So real nice play by Mitchell. Two outs now for Murphy Staley, the Big 12's leading hitter, who has grabbed another hit in this game. Staley now with a 20-game hitting streak. He'll get strike one. He and Dom Johnson so far through the early part of the season have been neck and neck for the 
title of being the Big 12's leading hitter. Here are the numbers for Staley, who's been a revelation this year for the Longhorns. Strike two of the breaking ball. The breaking pitch really fooled Staley. He kind of buckled a little bit, was up high, and then came down and broke into the zone. Pitch was up, chased it. And Justin Mitchell wanted that pitch out away a little bit more, and it was too much over the plate. It's great to go high, you want to go up, but you know, he was able to follow it off. That pitch is away. I don't think he makes contact with it. Way outside. Overcompensated to get there. Well, Hassel has had to work. As you can see, he's close to 50 pitches here in the third. So perhaps a little bit more work than K-State would have hoped for. Outside breaking ball spoiled again by Staley. Staley in his last year of college baseball, the redshirt senior, played at Orange Coast Community College before Coming to Texas, and now in his third and final season with the Longhorns. Again, just staying with it. You say last season, but with the COVID years, sometimes <laughs> you have players playing play five years, six years. And yeah, that's what we were talking about before the game. Austin Todd, who's in the lineup and is in the dugout at the moment, but Austin Todd is in his sixth year of college baseball, which is, and has made six opening day starts in a row, which Texas believes is a national record. And I don't think there's any argument against it. I would know no one who uh, starts six years in a row in the sport of baseball. And there's Austin Todd right there with the helmet on. He's do up on deck next should Staley reach and Ardwin get to the plate. Todd had a sacrifice bunt in his first at bat. Battled some injury bugs the last couple of years. With Staley having a great at bat here. Hanging tough and he has seen eight pitches and we'll get number nine coming up. Still 2-2 two -two could go up out of the zone. You get First two strikes on breaking pitches, so try to set up maybe a breaking pitch for the strike three. Change up. Got him swinging. Griffin Hassel has five strikeouts through of the year. He started in 14 games a year ago. This is his sophomore season. He'll slash this one foul right side, and it's 0-2. Usselton just one for four on the year. Hasn't had many at-bats, but showed some flashes last year. Hit a home run in Big 12 play against Texas Tech. A lot of room up the middle. If you can get it by the pitcher, the shortstop's playing Usselton, Usselton to pull. And the second baseman really hasn't shifted over too much. Instead, he'll take strike three in the outside corner, and that's seven strikeouts for Hansen first time through the order. And he's got three of or back to back strikeouts looking. When you have two strikes, you got to expand that zone a little bit. And uh, right now, the cats are kind of locked up. I think they're guessing maybe a little bit and really been thrown off balance by Hansen's uh, ability to throw on both sides of the plate up, down, and really mix in three pitches. First pitch to Nikolov. He swung. Strike one. Got the base hit on the fastball, and so Texas comes back with the breaking pitch on the first pitch. Nikolov on an 0-1 pitch, singled into left center field. Lays off this outside fastball, one and one. From that center field ca camera, you can really see that arm side run, that two-seam fastball on the outside part of the plate. Really has nice sink and movement away from the right-handed hitter. 
the outside corner there, one and two. Both of these two guys pinching tonight at times can make it look so simple and how they just throw strikes, attack the zone, and attack hitters. Strike three call to the outside edge. Pete Hansen mowing him down here in Manhattan. Two fastball or two breaking pitches there. One a little different than the other one. Got the swinging strike on a pitch that was out of the zone. Came back with two strikes. Breaking pitch back door. Strike three. And when he, I mean, he's controlling all three pitches and he's really controlling the timing of the Kansas State hitters, which is not good. <laughs> the hitter wants to be able to control that. Dom Johnson struck out his first time up. We're going to be saying that a lot, I think, here tonight. And he's quickly down 0-2. Even if you're trying to take pitches. Hanson just hammering the strike zone. And really playing with the psyche, too. For the first time through the order, he was throwing a lot of breaking pitches to the hitters. And with Dom, it, you know, got him to strike out on a breaking pitch and this time he starts in with two fastballs that Dom would normally swing at but you know going up there looking for the breaking pitch and gets ahead with the fastball. Fastball here pounded in the turf towards short so it's finally not a strikeout a high throw but in time low strike to both pitchers that is what both guys want to see. Well and that's where you want to keep the ball. This pitch was squared up, but on the windy night, will it get out? The answer is yes. The slugging Longhorns have hit their 58th home run of the season as Ardwan goes long and has his fifth of the year. Yeah, I've got a fastball and uh, squared it up, and uh, this, this is what uh, Texas does. The good news was for Kansas State, there was nobody else on base, but... Uh, they uh, they hit the home run ball. 58 home runs for the Longhorns to lead the Big 12. This is not your parents' Texas Longhorns. Austin Todd strike one. Not even your older brother's Texas Longhorns. This is a totally different makeup of a team. They are going to slug their way around the diamond Austin Todd takes one low one and one he's the aforementioned sixth year player it's freshman year 2017 started 40 games he'll try and go back to back and drive one out towards deep left center Cole Johnson though has enough room to play in the shadows of Bill Snyder Family Stadium in the distance makes the grab one out got a nice unfiltered view of Bill Snyder Family Stadium now here from the ballpark whereas before it was kind of peeking through the trees but as King State has cleared out with those trees dying already and then construction starting on the new volleyball arena and Olympic training center that will be built right behind the left field fence. Had a lot of questions uh, those out on the road uh, working this week and, and a lot of questions about the indoor facility the uh, volleyball coliseum the a lot of pride from the Kansas State people, fans, uh, about uh, the facilities that we're building here. Fly out to left for the second out. I mean, you think about it, going all the way back to the renovations first for football and what has been dumped ice, basketball training facility as well. You're talking about almost $300 million worth of, of Stadium facility improvements here at Kansas State at Kansas State folks ladies and that's a huge point of pride I would think if you're Kansas State I have the privilege Saturday of there's some uh, Manhattan High alums who let's just say they're 15 or 20 years older than I am and I'm an old man <laughs> I am going to be showing them the facilities Saturday they tour and some of them haven't been back so well, how eye-opening I, I is that? I Julie and I came here in 86, 87, and we can't believe the facilities that we have now. Griffin Hassel is going to get four flyouts in.
with you the next three days or the next couple of days for this three game series. Dylan Phillips after the first pitch. Jolts went out towards center field. Does it have enough? It does! The all time home run leader at K State has hit another. Well, Hansen decided to start him with a fastball and left it out over the middle of the plate. With Dylan Phillips, that's not a good plan. And he put a charge into it. Two thirds up the monster, the the, the uh, uh, out there in center field, and just did a did a tremendous job. And and that you know, you got to pick your pitches with Hanson. When he makes a mistake like he makes there, Kansas State has to capitalize. Told you in the first at bat that Phillips has hit left handers pretty well. I mean, he's hit near 360 and he's one for two off of Hansen with a home run. That's 10 now in the season for Phillips, 41 in his illustrious career. Goodwin seems stunned on the swing. I don't know if he caught it wrong off the bat, but he somewhat stumbled out of the box and he's thrown out at first the for the first out. Mitchell. Back to Phillips, 41 career home runs. And where that stacks among the Big 12 as far as career home run leaders. Did some research on this the other day. I'm just looking at who else in the Big 12 has career home runs that are, you know, in that relative range. Phillips, of course, sitting at that number for Kansas State. Is that comparable to the rest of the Big 12, or is there some guys that have been well above that number? Well, before he broke the record, I think Kansas State for the leading home run hitter, Scott Popard. 36. Yeah. Kind of in the lower part, lower That's half correct. of the Big 12 conference. There was only one team lower than that, actually two teams lower. Kansas, 35 from Ryan Price in West Virginia. Tim McCabe and Jed Giorco both had 35. So those are below. K-State now at 41. There are two other teams that have had their career home run leaders in the 40s as Mitchell rolls one to shortstop and underneath the mid of Faltini. That'll likely be a hit. And Mitchell is on with one out. TCU and Texas Tech, their career home run record is 44. Baylor 50 and Texas 57 from Kyle Russell. Who was the last player in Big 12 history to hit 50 or more career home runs. Phillips would need nine more to get to that plateau. Only seven players have ever hit 50 homers in their career as a Big 12 player, and Russell the last to do it back in the early aughts, 2008. Now tell you how that equates to the old gorilla ball days in the Big Eight <laughs> Conference. Pete Incavilla had 48 in one season. Well, he holds the all-time record for Oklahoma State, and it's triple figures. So, yeah, <laughs> that shows you how much different the bats are. Just going to that conversation. Johnson foul tips one into the mitt, one and one. Un 100 home runs just seems like a stupid crazy number like you just you're sitting here trying to picture that in your mind you're just I know LEP Reynolds was a small stadium back then but man that is a lot of home runs and then you mentioned 48 in one year ridiculous Johnson goes the other way wind will push this towards the Staley outfielder and he'll make the grab Staley does before foul ground two outs Kansas State's making adjustments up here the second time through the order getting a little bit better pitches Hanson's been up a little bit but also making the adjustment on the breaking pitch not trying to pull it not being too far out in front doing a really nice job you know Mitchell got the base hit on the breaking pitch that was an off-speed pitch away didn't you know just a little better contact and uh, the approach is a lot better. It's going to have to be because Hanson's stuff is really good tonight. Strike one to Culpepper, who walked on six pitches. The only walk issued by Hanson so far here tonight. Well, after going through the order, striking out seven of the first nine he faced, eight of the first ten that he faced, King State has put bat to ball here in five straight plate appearances. 
Yeah, I wasn't sure the fielders needed to bring a glove out there the way he started off. Because <laughs> I mean, the ground ball uh, by Johnson in the third inning for the thir third out was the first infield ground ball and actually the first out that a fielder got an assist or put out in other than the catcher. Yeah, we're starting to feel like that old Satchel Page line of everybody just go sit, take their gloves and sit down and take care of it. Hansen takes care of that one himself, flips it over to first, and that ends the inning. But the Wildcats are on the board. Might be the best breaking pitch that Hassel has thrown. He's tried to do it on the first pitch and left it up high a couple of times, gotten balls called, getting behind in the count, but that one he really got around and had good rotation and good snap to it. Faltini with a big swing and a miss. Good slider. Hassel thought that was strike three. It already walked off the mound, but it, it has ruled a ball. Gets the high tip, fastball into the mid of Mitchell. Strikeout number six. Yeah, pitches down in the zone, breaking pitches, slider. Challenged him up out of the zone. It's very good pitching, and you know, Hassel, other than a, a mistake or two, is, has really been pretty dominant for Kansas State. Big cut comes up empty for Campbell, who's one for two with a strikeout. That pitch is hammered to left by Campbell, and he knew he got it. Campbell connects with a home run, the second of the game for the slugging Longhorns, and they go back in front by three. Location, location, location. Fastball up in the zone, right about belt high, and uh, Campbell, uh, it was a no-doubter. Just whether it was going to go over the net there in left field, but that was right in the hit-me zone. He knew he got it. So Campbell with his fifth, team's 59th. And back to a three-run advantage. Breaking ball inside corner to Hodo for a strike. Hodo 0 for 2. And Texas is a team that does strike out, but they also launch and uh, you make a mistake out over the plate with that fastball, and they've squared up two of them. Heading the count one and two. See if he, if Kansas State goes up out of the zone, see if uh, Udo will chase one. Went away. Hassel had an 11 pitch inning last inning. He won't quite have the same ease here. 75 pitches working third time through here. That's off the end of the bat. Did he get enough? And Hodo is going to get it over the fence. Back to back home runs for the Longhorns. And even though there's solo shots, Texas starting to put some distance between themselves and K-State. Looked on the swing that he gotten it down off the end of the bat, but well, the pitch was away, but it was still up enough that he was able to drive. He really fastball has to be either out of the zone or down. It can't be, you know, you, you can throw it out of the zone up and have him chase or right outside a little bit or inside, but you know that tonight that when you throw a fastball that's uh Belt high, even if it's away a little bit, they're able to launch it and uh, 
I hope that wasn't off the end of the bat. Yeah, no, no doubt. <laughs> but he did have to go out and get it. It was away a little bit, but still up in the zone or a little higher than they wanted. So now 5-1 Longhorns. Griffin Hassel falls behind Melendez, who has certainly the ability to go back to back to back. 16 home runs on the season. It was a hanging breaking ball, but this will be a foul ball down the left field line. Wind or no wind as the wind has died down now. Texas starting to get some good swings on Hassel. This is Twain Family Stadium is more of a home run hitters ballpark. And Statistics K State will show that and the, the, in the alley straight away center field a lot bigger ballpark in Austin than it is here. Melendez takes the walk. That's the first issue today by Hassel. So here in this inning third time through Homer Homer walk against the Longhorns and Murphy Staley the batter. He's one for two struck out his last time up. And Griffin Hassel has to stay mentally really tough right now. You don't want the game to get away from Kansas State. Dealing with the toughest back to back hitters in the Big 12. Taking nothing away from the other teams in this league. Melendez Staley. Maybe not just the best three four hitters in the Big 12 perhaps in the country for anybody. They're both right handed, but you'd go back to Will Clark and Rafael Palmero at Mississippi State, you know, Thunder and Lightning, and that, that's what they have here in their, their three, four hitters. Melendez, clearly the more power of the two. Staley, truthfully, this kind of came out of nowhere, at least at this level. Staley hit very well in the junior college ranks out in California, won. Championship of the community colleges out in California as his second year in junior college and hit 374, but never really translated here at Texas until this season. Pop up out of the shallow right field. Nikolov will take care of that. Two outs. I mean, last year, Staley hit 295, but you're kind of like, all right, I mean, good hitter, but in the midst of a Texas lineup that was full of big offensive guys, nothing like this, not like 440 and leading the league and among the best of the country. Obviously, in the offseason, got a little stronger, worked on his swing and his discipline a little more. He has really flourished away from Austin, Texas, hitting 470 on the road this year. Hassel to deal with Silas Ardwan, who has a home run tonight for Texas. Three long balls for the Longhorns that now have 60 on the year. They have wrapped out seven hits against Griffin Hassel, five runs. Also struck out six times. Breaking ball makes it 0-2 to the catcher Ardwan. Had a Moss Bluff, Louisiana, which just sounds like an interesting place. Where is? That? I have no idea. I have no idea either. Moss Bluff. We'll look it up. Moss Bluff, Louisiana. Now, I'll, I'll say, you know, doing this for a while, you, you run across certain hometowns, certainly in the Texas teams, right? A lot of everybody in the Big 12 recruits Texas. So you, you end up seeing names of hometowns in the Lone Star State, also from Oklahoma, even Nebraska. You're like, yeah, I kind of got an idea where that's at. I've heard of that town before. I remember this player. He was from that same town. I can honestly say never, ever have heard of Moss Bluff, Louisiana. My fastball inside missed. Well, and when I was coaching, I'd always tell kids, particularly they say, well, I'm from a small town. Well, you'll see more small town Division I athletes, great baseball players, major league players that have come from small towns because baseball doesn't really care where you're from or how big you are or anything. Out of Moss Bluff, Louisiana. So we have discovered where Moss Bluff is. It is one hour east of Beaumont, Texas, which is right on the border between Louisiana and Texas. Probably you have to be going there to get there. 
I would think. Heinrich gives this one a ride, but it will be tracked down by Hodo in center. You're, you're going someplace else if you go through there. That's correct. Usually you're going from Beaumont on I-10 over to Lafayette, Louisiana, and about halfway is Moss Bluff, which is north of Lake Charles, Louisiana. So there, there's, there's your geography sort of... Uh, Lesson for today for the day. And I was mentioning that a lot of great baseball players come from small towns, and we have one in the crowd today um, from Gove, Kansas. Gove City, Kansas native Bobby Randall, King State Baseball Hall of Famer, former Major League Baseball star with the Minnesota Twins, longtime Big Eight coach as well. I've been to Gove, Kansas two or three times once was not a very pleasant time okay I had to pay a fine for texting while I was driving oops um, I-70 it's it is off of I-70 south of I-70 south it's uh past Quinter on your way to Oakland it's just that part of I-70 that turns northeast past Oakwoods right before you get there there's the turn off to go to Gove yep City, Kansas, two and two to Usselton, who struck out his first time out. And it was the day after KU had beaten us in basketball, and the judge was a KU graduate. Oh, boy, just that. She was all over me. That's great, she great stuff. Did not give me much leniency. That's what you call a bad 24 hours, right there. <laughs> Usselton tried to go through that hole on the right side, but couldn't get past Melinda's at first. Two gone. Third time through for the Wildcats begins now with Josh Nikoloff against Pete Hansen. He struck out eight of the first ten he's faced. The Wildcats have adjusted since then. Second time through, they were able to touch him up for a couple of hits, including the home run. Now we'll see third time through. Can they get him out of the game? The one weakness of Texas, and it's not a, a huge glaring weakness, but the one soft spot for Texas this year has been a little bit of inconsistency in the bullpen. All the talent in the world, but just haven't been as consistent as they would like. Wildcats would be hopeful to get there, although, as you can see, it's 65 pitches. Hansen in a great shape here to go as long as he wants. He's been very efficient. Chopper will be a tough play. Mikolov runs well on the run. Messing him. Mess who thirds. He has struck out six for a second time. Three and one here. And... His season high of pitches was uh, even 100 at TCU, but in his career, he has thrown over 110 in a game that was against TCU in this ballpark and a win against the Horned Frogs when he went seven and two thirds. But he'll open up with a five pitch walk to Austin Todd. And really, for the first time, we've seen Griffin House will be a little bit wild and erratic with his command. So we'll see if K State starts to get some action going in their bullpen, which has equally been. A bit of a mystery for Pete Hughes and his team this season. All the talent of the world out there, but have struggled with them some consistency. There's the line for a hassle. Three of those home, uh, runs have come on solo shot homers. And Skyler Messinger, a two RBI base hit. I was going to say Griffin has, has been really around the plate most of the time. This was the first batter where he really looked like he lost his feel for the breaking pitch and then overthrew a fastball and was completely outside of the zone. One for two day for Messinger, the former Jayhawk. Two RBI base hit in the second. Goes the other way with it off the end of the bat and a little dunker will fall in in right field. First two on here in the sixth inning. That, that was off the end of the bat, but you know he did a nice job staying back on the ball and hitting it to that direction to where you know just unfortunate for Kansas State that it was off the end of the bat and wasn't driven harder. But uh, when you walk the first batter and then get the little blue pit, wouldn't be surprised if Texas did a little small ball in this situation. King State thinking the same has pulled their corner batters or defenders in against the batter daily and Hassel turns to see if 
Daly would tip his hand at all. This, this will be a true test because right old Texas lead. for sure. This is absolutely 100 percent a bunt. Yeah. Good bunt. Mitchell's only played a first and just in time with the second baseman covering. So there's still a little bit of the old Texas in there. Smart baseball there by the Longhorns. There is a, I one in the way the ball was spinning. Whether Mitchell, if he let that go, would have the ball was kind of working toward the third. You know, it's a bang bang play. You want to get it out. You don't want to take a chance of loading the bases. So he made the right play. But I was you know. the only thing I, I'm with you there. It looked like there was some side spin on that, but it didn't look like it had much on it. I don't know. Maybe it, you run the risk of it dying, of course, right on the turf. And as you said, Mitchell at that point had to, if he was going to throw, he had to take it and throw it. Yep. So a smart play by the veteran, even though the runners now in scoring position. Kansas State's going to scoot the infield in, try to cut the run off at home plate. Baltini has not had good swings against Hassel. He has struck out twice. K State would love a strikeout here to put them in a position of two outs and be able to move the infield back. There is action in the K-State bullpen as K-State's hassle is finishing his third time through and Mitchell wants everyone to be on the same page here is going to go out to the mound and this could also be a, a conversation. I mean Faltini handles the bat well. He's got two sacrifices this season. He wouldn't put it past Texas to drop another bunt down when the race on this on the mound. It's a Texas product. Despite the high gas, that's really where he's been most successful was with his slider. Yep, and that, that, that was more about where he started the pitch. It actually broke out of the zone, but it was up in the zone. But the key was it was out and got the swing. Came back with it again. And it's fouled away by Faltini. Even though Neighbors has a little more velocity than what Hassel did, K State's still playing to pull. Three infielders on the left side of the infield. And in. There's a fastball, strike three call to the outside corner at 93 miles an hour. Set him up with all of those breaking pitches and then came with the fastball inside corner and great location just above the knees. Good start for neighbors. Campbell homered in his last at bat his first look now at neighbors infielders can back up a bit still playing the pull as the fastball misses away. Campbell struck out in the first singled in the third homered in the fifth single and homer both to left field. The slider buckled knees one and one. That's the best location he's had for the slider down in the zone. Very tough to lift that pitch. Neighbors was a top 25 pitcher in the state of Texas last year as a senior. First team all state pick. District MVP. Another slider, another strike. This is the best neighbors has looked since day one of the season in game one against Arizona. He started that breaking pitch a little farther in was able to cut it across the inside corner. Very tough for a right handed hitter to pick that pitch up. One two fastball pounded in the turf the short. Goodwin's throw right on time and neighbors comes out of the bullpen and gets King State out of the jam. Johnson Phillips Goodwin Phillips the only ding against Hanson to this point a solo homer back in the fourth. Tom Johnson one of the Big 12's leading hitters takes one away for ball one Johnson second in the Big 12 in multi hit games. One of the conference leaders with a 392 average. Chops this one to third Messinger drops the baseball but still throws in time to get Johnson and largely because he was playing in he was able to make the play. 
He has a breaking pitch. Johnson's just pounded it into the turf. A little trouble with the exchange, but able to recover. And, you know, with the turf, that ball's going to stay around you, so just reach down, pick it up, and make the play. See Messinger moving over to shallow right field and the shift here for Texas. So they'll leave Faltini, the shortstop, at his natural position. Put the shift on for Phillips, three infielders right of second base. Put a discussion on the major league level. There was an article written about it here recently talking with Theo Epstein, the former general manager of the Red Sox, Chicago Cubs, has won World Series championships and has moved out of the GM president operations game and into an advisory role with Major League Baseball. And his job has been to look and study the game in ways to change it to make it better. The conversation centered on shifts and whether to ban shifts at the major league level. And of course, there's two sides to every story. This ball has popped up left side. Does it have enough is the story at the wall. It's enough to get out. Yes, sir. Another home run for Dylan Phillips. Ninth career two homer game for Dylan Phillips. And he's got seven in the last 10 games. And when Dylan Phillips is right, he drives the ball the opposite way. Now, that was an inside out swing. The pitch was up, which allowed him to drive it. But he was able to keep his hands inside, get the barrel through, and had enough to get it out of the yard for second home run of the game and get the Cats a run closer. Back to a three-run ball game. Boy, Pete Hansen has done great against the rest of the Wildcat lineup, but against Dylan Phillips, Phillips two for three with two solo homers. Good one shoots this one back. Back to the shifts. There's a lot of folks that are, are just staunchly against shifts and defensive alignments that need to have a rule of got to have at least two infielders each side of the base, something like that. There are others that are like, eh, who cares? Just hit it the other way, right? If you're a good enough hitter, you can hit over the shift. And I thought the comments from Theo Epstein were interesting, and he described the argument about looking at NBA basketball, for example, zone defenses and man-to-man, -man, that there are rules in place in the NBA because you have such tremendous athletes, you can't, you know, just unguard somebody for the entirety of a possession. Goodwin wraps one to shortstop. Faltini will have this. Two outs. What's your take on the shift? Is it something that needs to be done away with in baseball? No, go ahead and play it. And I'll have my players bunt down the third baseline every time. And, and that's the situation here. You've got Dylan Phillips as a home run hitter. But if Texas were to shift any of the other eight players, I would time out, come down here, give me a bunt. It doesn't even have to be a drag bunt because the shortstop or the third baseman's playing in right field and the shortstop. Right. I mean, do it. And, and that will stop the shift. But unfortunately, in the major leagues and the way baseball's being played, college, major leagues, everything, it's all about lifting the ball over the shift and home runs, which also leads to a lot of strikeouts, a lot of boring play, and a lot of long ball games. And, and so... I'm an, you know, you're probably asking the wrong. <laughs> I, about halfway through your answer, I figured that that's where we were going to end up with was yeah. asking the wrong guy. But in, in some respects, it is a valid discussion because your opinion matters. But for the younger generation, they have to get baseball and like baseball. And if it's boring, as you're talking about, if it's all, if it's only three outcomes, if it's a strikeout, a walk, or a home run, that's not going to grasp those young people that are watching this game. The home run, sure, but a strikeout, a walk, that's pretty boring stuff. Mitchell's going to try and go the other way. Out of the right center field gap. That is off the wall. Mitchell will lumber into second base with a double. And the Wildcats... Mitchell and Phillips have combined for four of the five hits off of Pete Hansen. Now, what's the connection to that? The balls of it, their hits have been up the middle, other way. They haven't tried to pull. They haven't been too much in front. Cats are making a nice adjustment to Hansen and bet, doing better the second and third time through. 
but they have to continue to that. You know, the next hitter, Cole Johnson, he needs to look the up, up the middle the other way and make that adjustment. Johnson did go the other way. His last at bat flight out to deep right field down the line. Johnson, who has a slightly closed stance, the plate will take the pitch low for ball once. The first time we've seen Hanson struggle a bit with command, and while no one's throwing it for Texas in their bullpen, there are some bodies down there and a couple of guys doing some calisthenics or conditioning, maybe perhaps to get loose. That ball shot up the middle. That's a base hit. Another two out RBI for Cole Johnson as Justin Mitchell will get around third and score before the cutoff throw gets in. And K State has cut the gap to two. Quality at bat by Cole Johnson. He got a breaking pitch and just stayed back, didn't try to do too much, and just drive it up the middle, up the middle of the way. That's, that, that's really what these hitters. The adjustments they've been able to make and the success Kansas State's having was, is with that approach. Cole Johnson, 13 of his 19 RBIs this year have come with two outs. He is a 400 hitter with two outs and does it again with another two out RBI. Boy, did K State miss, as you said, his bat last weekend. Kalen Culpepper, 0 for 1 with a walk. K-State gets the tying run to the plate here in the sixth inning against the ace of the Texas staff. Under the hands of Culpepper, and he's down 0-2. Now, the other thing that Kansas State has done is they've got Hanson up to 84 pitches here in the sixth inning. Two innings ago, it looked like he could, you know, breeze right through for nine. Now they're going to get his pitch count. Kansas State's going to get the pitch count for Hanson up and possibility of getting into the bullpen in that seventh, eighth, ninth inning possibly. Underneath the hands again of Culpepper, but a bit too far inside. The three runs allowed by Hansen. This is just the third time this year that he's allowed three runs or more in a start. Texas Tech, Nevada, and South Carolina, the other three teams that have done it in the career against Pete Hansen, I should say. Ground ball, third base side. Another chance for Messinger. He'll sidearm it over to first and get Culpepper to end the inning. Kansas State, though, gets three hits in the inning off the ace of the Texas staff. It all started with a second homer of the game from Dylan Phillips, the all-time leader in K-State history. That's a ball game here on Big 12 Now. Wildcat fans, young and old, taking in this one here today at Toynton Family Stadium. They've been treated to a good one in the opening game of a three-game series. The Wildcats with two runs to get back to within two as they turn again to Tyson Neighbors, who got the Wildcats out of a big jam in the sixth. He'll get the two, three, four hitters for the first time here in the seventh. First pitch, a pretty good one, but ruled ball one. Douglas Hodo homered his last time up for the Longhorns, one of three solo shots they have hit. K-State has hit two homers, two solo shots from Dylan Phillips. It's called a strike on the inside corner. One and one to Hodo. That's been the key for neighbors is being able to get that slider in the strike zone and control it, getting ahead in the count and then using it to get the strike out outside the count or outside the strike zone. Slider foul back one and two. At the beginning of the season, K-State had big plans for neighbors. They had thought that he would be their closer all season long. And opening game of the year against number 10, Arizona, he looked every bit the part. And you're thinking, here you go. Wildcats for one have one thing for certain in their bullpen. That's the back end. But things went awry from there, not just for neighbors, but really everybody in the bullpen for the Wildcats. And what has been a learning year for a lot of new faces. K-State only two guys back that pitched last year meaningful innings at this level on that pitching staff. And it showed. Everybody had to deal with new rules. And playing a difficult schedule on top of that to begin Big 12 play. Four ranked teams, three in the top ten successively. It has really hurt the psyche of this young Wildcat core. 
just missed outside edge. So after getting ahead 0-2 on Hodo, Neighbors loses him to a walk, and that's the first runner to reach against Neighbors. He got the strikes with the sliders, but didn't throw one fastball in the strike zone. And on 3-2 with a fastball missed. I think that's the first walk for the Texas Longhorns tonight. Well, Hassel did have two there in the last two innings that he threw, but not as many as you might think. Fastball blown past Melendez, who was not showing bunt. So to your point earlier about this team being different than the Texas teams of the past, even with the game now two runs, Melendez, the slugger, not up there bunting, at least not on the first pitch. No sacrifices this year by Melendez. And the throw Case is empty. So Neighbors kind of picks himself up by getting the pickoff after giving up the walk. His first career pickoff. And there's the slider for a strike. And so far, that's been the lone pitch that has really been in the strike zone consistently for Neighbors, as Mike mentioned. That will have to change if he's to stay in the game and be successful. And fastball just missed. Two and two. Well, that's a pitch that been called earlier. I mean, I've seen balls called strikes that were just a little bit under the knees. And that one, well, that was a tough one to take. That one was a little bit higher, nearly grabbed by Nikoloff, who had him shaded perfectly up the middle, but just over the outstretched bit of Nikoloff and Melendez to first base with the base hit. Now, how big was that pickoff? Would have been first and second for the Longhorns. Nobody out. Yeah, that pitch was up belt high, and good hitter like Melendez is going to put a charge into it. Staley with one out and a runner at first. Staley will be played to pull on the infield. He has singled today left side, struck out and popped out. Gets one up near his eyeballs for ball one. There is action behind neighbors in the bullpen for K-State. This is where it's tough for a freshman player that doesn't have a lot of experience is making the adjustment from pitch to pitch, bat to bat, and being consistent, being able to put the pitch in the location that you want to. And uh, seen two or three pitches here where it's just more or less overthrown and just trying to muscle the ball up rather than just letting their stuff, letting uh, neighbor's stuff make the pitch and get the out. That was Herman Fajardo who was Look to be ready to go in the bullpen if needed. His neighbors tries to recover here. Got two big outs to end the six with runners second and third and only one out. In relief of Hassel, King State got two runs to get back within two. Little pickoff move by neighbors and again very close. Melinda's just in there. That throw was in the turf. I think if it had been clean at first base it would have been pretty close and Melendez has a pretty good lead Staley swings and misses and it's two and two sitting on the fastball able to throw the slider executed it perfectly Two, 2 whistle down the line, a base hit. The 20th multi-hit game of the season for Murphy Staley. Melendez trying to score from first. The relay throw, plenty of time, he is out. There is the cutoff that is perfect. Execution on that play. Ball down the line, hard hit. Dom Johnson goes down, picks it up. P perfect strike to Goodwin. Goodwin turns, catches the ball on the glove side, turns, throws a strike to Mitchell at home plate. Great execution, and the defense has kept Kansas State in the ball game here in the seventh inning. Murphy Staley gets the double, but not the RBI. Two outs now, two mistakes on the bases by the Longhorns. Here's Ardwan, who's two for three with a home run. And a fastball for a strike. Neighbors, more than anybody, was as pumped up about that play at the plate. 
one of the things that the coaches liked about neighbors coming in was that as a football player he had the football player mentality on the mound very emotionally invested in the game and then sometimes that can work against you it looks to be ready to go and chomping at the bit against the Longhorns here tonight high fastball and hard one did not offer one and one Staley by the way as I said 20 multi-hit games for Staley that's tops of the Big 12 he is just ahead of Dom Johnson, who is sitting right behind at 18 multi-hit games. Staley has now hit in 20 straight. Nothing but fastballs to begin the at bat for Ardwan. And it's two and one. Not out of the woods yet. Longhorns with Staley at second, who can really run, could get a base hit in an RBI and get a run back here. King State just scored two in the bottom of the sixth to pull it into but the Longhorns now with 10 hits on the day including a couple of home runs. Yeah, I think Kansas State got a little bit of a break the hitter asked for timeout and the pitch clock was down under five seconds so could have been ball three awarded if it had reached zero. Inside corner slider, two and two. So neighbors a strike away from getting out of the inning and getting the Wildcat hitters back to the plate. Eight, nine, one hitters do up in the bottom of the seventh after the stretch. The time is Called and there is the pitch clock warning. Third base umpire Matt Anderson giving that to Tyson Neighbors. So the next time there is a violation on the pitch clock, it would be a strike or a ball against Neighbors. Comes back to the same spot, just missed inside and down. Full count. Well, that was he's throwing a couple of really good pitches that have been called balls. Maybe a little down, but he's been given that low strike. Challenged him with a fastball, fouled it back. Three and two still. See the hitter on time on the fastball. Might come back with a slider. Try to get him out in front a little bit more. Or throw it for a strike and break out. If he's on time with the fastball. Missed outside. Second walk this inning issued by neighbors. First and second, two outs. And he'll have to shake off a pitch that didn't go his way and try and get Austin Todd. Yeah, that's part of the mental side also. You think you've got him struck out. Don't get the call. You have to stay focused, stay confident what you're throwing. Todd has reached on a walk, fly down to center, and then had a sack bunt in his first at bat. Fastball away for ball one. You can see it and hear it in the background. Pete Hughes. Giving his opinion towards the home plate area and Chris Kosky fighting for his guys. Coaching staff there for K-State. Austin Waits in the purple with Pete Hughes. He's the hitting coach for K-State. And then Buck Taylor who runs the pitchers. Popped up. Johnson settling underneath it. He'll make the grab. Tyson Neighbors works out of a couple of jams there in the seventh. Texas is stranded seven. Or it's the stretch here of the seventh. King State down two on Big 12 now. Fans doing the Wabash Cannonball here at Twitten Family Stadium. Seventh inning tradition. 
here at the ballpark. As Kansas State tries to rally down 5 1 at one point. They've cut the gap to two as they battle the bottom of the seventh. Brian Smother, Mike Clark with you, our entire crew. Pete Hansen against Griffin House. It was our pitching matchup to start. Pete Hansen has remained. 86 pitches for him through six innings. He's allowed the three runs on six hits. Most of those hits have been grouped between Justin Mitchell and Dylan Phillips, who have combined for four of the six. Here's Jeff Heinrich to lead it off in the seventh inning. King State finishing off their third time through the order against the left-hander. Texas doesn't have anybody throwing officially yet in the bullpen, just a couple of the guys milling around. One and one to count to Heinrich. Strikeout and a flyout for Heinrich so far today. In his seventh start of the year, game number 32 for the Wildcats. He'll drive one deep to left. Does it stay fair? It does. He's done again. Jeff Heinrich with another home run for the Wildcats. His fourth of the season, all four here at Toynton Family Stadium. Hanson was able to get strike one and ball one. One one count off of fastballs away. Then he left a breaking pitch over the middle of the plate. And Hendrick just launched it. A no doubter to left field, and the Cats are within one run. Three solo shots for the Wildcats, who led the Big 12 in home runs last year with 89. Heinrich cleared the bullpen with that one. Here's Usselton, who will take strike one. Usselton 0 for 2 in his first start of the season. Pitch that was up, fouled back, and it's 0 and 2 to the native of Moore, Oklahoma. So a season high four runs allowed by Pete Hansen, who is the heavy favorite for Big 12 Pitcher of the Year. At least a season high in conference play. Hansen coming off back-to-back -back starts where he's only allowed four hits, one run in 17 innings with 24 strikeouts. I think everybody that's watched and followed Kansas State knows they've got a decent offense. Usselton floods the gap in right center. That'll get down. Usselton's got wheels. He's headed towards second. Head first up. Mikeloff does not have a bunt this season, but handles the bat well for more. All Ivy League standout player at Columbia. Hansen just stepped off. He's looking into the Texas dugout as he's getting some instructions from David Pierce, the head coach on defense. And time called for a moment. K-State wants a pinch runner here for Jeff Heinrich out at second. Brendan Jones is going to come off the bench. Speedster from Greenbrier, Tennessee. We'll take over for Heinrich as the pinch hitter, but Heinrich, not Heinrich, sorry, Usselton out at second. So Usselton did his job and is up one for three. And Jones, who's a good defensive outfielder, will take over for Usselton at second. So K-State making all the chess pieces they can and the moves they can here to try and get the tying run in. Kansas State's going to get this bunt down. If it's down the third base side, they have to make sure it can get by the pitcher. With a left-handed pitcher, it's natural for him to pick it up and be able to throw to third base. Makes it a real easy play. So they've got Texas has the first baseman in to, for the opportunity to throw to third base also if it's hard to the first base side. So if you're going to bunt, Here's the bump by Nikoloff. Deaden, they'll go to third, and the tag will be in time to get Jones. And that's what I was just talking about. You can't bunt it back to the pitcher, or you can't bunt it softly just to the left side. It has to be a firm bunt that forces the third baseman to come off the bag and, and field it and, and throw it over there. So great execution by Texas. Not good execution on the bunt. 
Fielder's choice for Nikolov. He's there with one out. Dom Johnson, the batter. K State's best hitter is coming up. But now runner at first, one out. And Johnson takes one away. Fourth look for Johnson against Hansen. He has struggled so far. A couple of the ground outs left side and a strikeout of the first. It's also, as a base runner, you have to read that also. You see it down right back to the pitcher. You freeze because you have a runner in scoring position. Make them make the throw across in that situation also. Unfortunately, K-State this season's had a bugaboo about making outs between second and third on the bases. Well, that's not as egregious as some of the others. That is another opportunity lost, as you said, with a runner in scoring position. Still, Cats have a man on the tying run at first. Hansen's pitch count climbing as he deals with Johnson for the fourth time. And 2-0 to Dom Johnson. I'm going to guess Dom Johnson's going to get a pitch to hit here because Phillips is on deck. So I don't want to be too eager can't, uh, from Johnson's standpoint. But uh, I would look for something to drive here. And then if it's not, if it's a breaking pitch or a changeup, be able to hold up and take strike one. Challenged him, but he did not get around on the fastball. Two and one. Yeah, had a good cut, though. Just pulled off of it. He was ready for it. And Hanson won that pitch, but it wasn't because Johnson was being too timid. Strike two. Side three and two. In case you were wondering, K State will likely not start the runner, even though Nikoloff runs well. Ard one has thrown out 40% of the runners that have tried to challenge him, throwing down to second. So, not an opportunity to try and put a guy in motion. Huge hole right side for Johnson if he could go backside. Nikoloff holds, and the fastball fouled away. And Johnson has a tendency to strike out occasionally also. So it's, you want somebody who maybe this is a little more of a contact hitter if you're going to start that runner. Fourth consecutive game over 100 pitches for Pete Hansen. He has thrown on average 115 pitches his last two starts. As Texas has tried to stay away from their bullpen that's had some issues. Southern has been warming in the bullpen. A hard throwing right hander. We'll see if he gets the opportunity to come in to face Phillips or not. Ball four low. And again, that low strike that we've seen called a few times from Chris Koski suddenly has not been called consistently here late for either side. And the Wildcats with two men on, and that tying run is back in scoring position. And you can see Chris Koski hearing it from the Texas dugout. In the last couple innings, uh, he's been hearing it from both dugouts. And tough pitch to take, but Tom Johnson did. And well, now, if you're Texas, Mike, what do you do? I mean, you got Dylan Phillips, who's homered twice off of you in your star pitcher. It's lefty lefty matchup, but nowhere to put Phillips. Oh, you got a pitch to him. Back to back homers and back to back at bats for Phillips. And a breaking ball for ball one. And that was a high breaking pitch. That was a uh, didn't execute until 102 pitches. And particularly coming off of back to back outings of 115 pitches. Execution here the last three, four innings hasn't quite been what it was earlier. So far, two pitches well out of the zone to Phillips.
Does he get something to hit here at 2 and 0? Oh? Have to be disciplined if you're Dylan Phillips and just look for a pitch in a certain spot. Ball three. Good discipline. Talked about the home runs in the recent game stretch here for Phillips. He called it some time ago that once he got the record that he would take off and that has been the case. He's hit 400 in his last nine games. Not only does he have the seven home runs here now in 10 games. He has nine walks in his last nine games as well. So not afraid to take the base and let someone else do the work. Swinging three and oh misses three and one. Fastball outside part of the plate. Dylan Phillips was looking on the inside part of the plate. Well, a pretty big pitch in this game coming up right now. Three and one from Hansen. Trying to bounce back after funnel buying three and oh to Dylan Phillips, who's already thrown or has already hit two home runs tonight. I like the fact that Pete gave. Dylan Phillips, the green light, 3-0. He's your hot hitter. He's got a chance to, to really wreck this game and break it wide open from the Wildcat perspective. So. Hard one out to the mound to talk with Hanson, maybe changing up the signals. With the runner at second base, they want to make sure, as we just said, this is a pretty important pitch in this game for both teams. And Texas wants to make sure they're on the right wavelength. Dugout trying to spur on their star. Strike on the outside corner. Three and two. And that pitch was on the white part of the other batter's box. That was a perfect pitch from a Texas perspective. Three two hits slowly to short. They'll get the out. No, it's misplayed by Texas at second. Coming in to score is Nikolov. Didn't get the barrel out in front. Goodwin drives one deep towards left center field. Back is home. Against Southern, we told you coming in that he's had some struggles with the long ball here lately, and he's going against one of the best long ball hitting teams in Kansas State. Who suddenly now have all the confidence in the world, looking for yet another top 10 win. And what an opening salvo this would be in this series if they could keep it rolling from here. So a lot of game left. Slider missed up to Mitchell, and it's one and two. Yeah. Top of the seventh inning, Texas had all sorts of base runners. Kansas State picked the runner off, threw a runner out at home plate, and made plays. Texas in the bottom didn't make the play, and Kansas State's made them pay. Mitchell strikes out for the second out. Mitchell two out of four today, and now Cole Johnson, who had a two RBI base hit back in the sixth inning, will come to the plate for his first look at the Fireballer Southern. Four homers today for Kansas State. There's no place like home. <laughs> it has been an unbelievable turn at Toynton Family Stadium. Really, this was a trend last year as well for K-State. Under Pete Hughes and Austin Waits, the Wildcats have just slaughtered people here inside their friendly confines. Wind blowing out or not, they have just torched people inside this ballpark. And it's quickly earning a reputation of being a fearsome place to play. 0-2 to Cole Johnson. And Cole Johnson's seen two sliders. Good pitches on the outside part of the plate. Seven runs in the last two innings for K-State. Five here in the seventh. Late 
Feed off a good fastball just off, off the plate. Slider outside corner, strike three. And that'll do it for K-State. But they score five in the seventh inning and hand Pete Hansen his worst start. Transfer from Arizona against the bottom third of the Texas lineup with the first pitch bobbled by Culpepper. He'll pick it up, throw to first, and not quite get Messenger. So K-State commits their own defensive miscue to open up the top of the eighth inning. Yeah, it looked like he... Culpepper got a little wide on the ground ball and let the ball get underneath him. Maybe lost the ba his balance just a little bit. He's been really reliable there at third base. But uh, Texas, after giving Kansas State an opportunity to have a big inning, first batter for Texas gets on with an error. First pitch swinging. Mitchell Daly pops it up right side. The wind will push this back into play, and it's made by Phillips the catch and foul ground for the first out and a break for the Wildcats let's go back to the last inning uh, Goodwin three run home run huge play but don't forget the relay he did on the That's throw right. from left field that threw the runner out at the plate that kept Texas from scoring in the seventh inning so not just his bat but his glove was key to Kansas State getting the lead here in the seventh inning. Right point. Bunt tried to be put down by Faltini. And they have bunted it twice. I say it was a foul ball, strike one. I'm saying the ball bounced up, but he was still in the box when it hit him. So if K State wants to challenge this or not, Pete Hughes has come out. He was definitely in the box. Here's the replay. Pitch goes over his head. That'll get the runner down to second. So no need to bunt when the wild pitch takes care of that. So an air and a wild pitch have the Longhorns in scoring position with one out. And yeah, that pitch slipped out of his hand. And with the runner at second and the veteran messenger at that, K State will. Converse them out about their signs. You can look at Fajardo looking down at his fingers. In this era of spin rates and trying to get more bite on the ball. We've talked about this before. The seams lower on the baseball than they have been in years past. Makes it harder to grip sometimes. And if you're biting down on that with your fingertips and your fingernails, trying to get better spin, sometimes it can spin out of your hand and be quite errant. Oh, for three day for Faltini. Another one wild. It's kicked away by Mitchell, and that allows the runner to get the third. Mitchell had knocked it down, but in his haste to get up, it looked like his own foot knocked it away. But tough for the catcher because if the ball's down underneath you, you can't see it. You don't have a real feel. You just know that it got by the five hole, which is in between your legs. And. Uh, just kicked it away enough to uh, allow Messenger to get to third base. Two wild pitches in this inning. And a 3-1 count to Faltini. will take a strike all the way there, and it's a full count now. Not a lot of foul ground here at Toynton Family Stadium, so should there be another wild pitch, it's not automatic that Messenger will break to home. Outside corner did not get the call, ball four. Again, that's been consistently not called either way here down the stretch. And now two on, one out, and the tie run coming to the plate. They look to be a little off the plate and down. Here comes Pete Hughes. There is action in K-State's bullpen. As the head coach of the Wildcats heads out to the mound. Fajardo has been not as sharp as we've seen him. 
The Wildcats, sensing the game is hanging in the balance here, does not want to lose it. Pink Hughes going to try and pump up Fajardo here. He'll be a needed piece for them moving forward. We'll take a break, come back, tell you about the new pitcher. The second ever career relief appearance for Connor McCullough being made here in this ball game. 29th appearance overall as a Wildcat. He has been exclusively a starting pitcher. Pitched in relief in one game last year in the Big 12 Championship against TCU. In the semifinal round as K-State eventually won that game but tried to get to the championship. And lost in the second game against TCU. McCullough allowed three runs, two of them earned in three and two thirds. Pete Hughes has said over and over again, they will do whatever it takes to win a game. And they're at the point with the bullpen being as unreliable as it is, you're going a little bit off the play, off out of the box thinking right here. Connor McCullough, who's been the Sunday starter, third day starter, whatever, for K-State, getting his relief appearance here with two on, one out in the eighth inning. All Kansas State is working on right now is win number two in the Big 12 Conference. And you have an opportunity, or Kansas State has an opportunity right now to do that. You want an experienced arm. You know, he's been through the Big 12. If you compare it to Adams, this is his first time through the Big 12. This is, he's, for, and it may work, may not work, we'll, we'll see. But I really like the move. I, I, I think it's shown your team and it's shown everybody we're we're going to win this ball game and we're going to worry about Sunday when Sunday rolls around. Situation where if, if Connor doesn't throw a lot of pitches, he can still start. Round ball right to Culpepper, the second for one, the turn to first and double play. That could not have gone any better. K-State's dugout empties to welcome McCullough. He gets the double play, and K-State the three-run lead coming back to the plate. This is the matchup for tomorrow. Game two of the three-game series. K-State may be riding an upset. We'll see. It'll be Blake Adams back in the starting rotation for the Wildcats. The junior transfer from Arkansas. He'll be working against Tristan Stevens, the Richard senior out of Springfield, Missouri, in his final year of college baseball. Both an ERA about the same. Strikeout numbers way an advantage for Adams, but also has higher walk numbers. That'll be the pitching matchup tomorrow, 6 o'clock, for the broadcast here on Big 12 Now. On ESPN Plus, Pete Hughes' team looking for their second straight home upset against a top 10 team. Still some work to be done. Kalen Culpepper, who just started that inning ending 5 4 3 double play. Good bounce back for Culpepper after the air to start the inning. He'll open up the eighth inning facing Southern for the first time, and he'll take a fastball for ball one. Lower part of the zone suddenly gone dry as far as the strike zone. Well, Pete Hughes has talked about Kansas State building on leads and not being satisfied with just a two run lead, three run lead, but expand that so that if something does happen late in the ball game, you've got a cushion. And, and uh, I'm sure he's going to be watching Kansas State see if they can tack on an insurance run or two here in the eighth inning. Pepper will take a pitch. It's two and one. Two ground outs today for Kalen Culpepper. He also has a walk. Made the air, but also a huge double play ball. And he was able to turn that last half inning. He's been a defensive star for K-State at third base this year. Two and two. South has been able to throw two. Good fastballs down in the zone on the outside part of the plate to get the count back to two and two. Breaking ball and Southern 
Trying to get that slider over, gets it fouled away by Culpepper. Culpepper in his first run through the Big 12. We talked about that before, about guys making their first time in the Big, Big 12s. Culpepper is a freshman, slashing 296, 367, 519 in his first year in the league through eight games. So halfway through the conference schedule, he has been very good for the Wildcats at the plate. Trying to go the other way here, fouls another one off. Three doubles and a homer in Big 12 play for Culpepper, who does have power. Pete Hughes has talked at length, at length about that, along with Austin Waits, that they believe this guy in his career will eventually become a big-time power hitter. Or at least more power than his frame would lend you to believe. 2-2, Two -two, jam shot to third. Messinger will take care of Culpepper. That's the first out here in the eighth. It has been a wild one today. Griffin Hassel started. He went a good start. Ended up giving up a couple of solo homers early. Ran into some trouble in the sixth. Left after a five and a third, allowing five runs, striking out a season-high six. Tyson Neighbors came in and was electric to get the final two outs of the sixth inning, keep runners at second and third from scoring. Neighbors worked around some issues in the seventh. Texas had a man picked off, a guy thrown out at the plate. And the Wildcats did the rest on the offensive side, somewhat keyed by this guy, Jeff Heinrich, who homered to lead off the five-run seventh. Texas slider away, one and one. Wildcats have hit four homers tonight, two by Dylan Phillips. Heinrich hit the third. It was followed by a Cameron Usselton double. A failed sacrifice bunt by Nikoloff that ended up being a fielder's choice. And then one of the key moments of this game, Dom Johnson, after a walk, and he was headed to second. And the ground ball off the bat of Dylan Phillips could have been an inning-ending double play, but instead the ball was thrown away by Faltini trying to hit Mitchell Daly at second base, and that allowed a run to score to tie the game. Henrik will strike out. And then the Wildcats, the big blow, once Hansen was lifted from the game, the first batter that Southern faced was Nick Goodwin, and he took an 0-1 pitch out to left center field for a three-run homer. Worst start of the career of Pete Hansen, who was the heavy favorite for Big 12 Pitcher of the Year. 2.08 ERA to lead the league coming in. He gave up seven runs today against K-State, six of them earned. Brendan Jones came in as a pinch runner. He was forced out at third base. And the attempted bunt and the sacrifice back in the seventh. He's been playing center field since. He'll get his first plate appearance of the night. And a rare plate appearance for him. He's just had two official plate appearances this season. Mostly used as a pinch runner. He is out of Greenbrier, Tennessee. Got the count in his favor. Looking for a fastball here. Got it, but it's missed. Down and in. 3 and 0. Oh. eligibility but just missed the cusp of the draft last year has improved his velocity 91 to 93 with a fastball great curveball and a changeup and there's the fastball right down the heart of the plate for strike three and Connor McCullough on the doorstep of his first career save that was a fastball that just froze Whitehead he obviously was looking for something else because of the velocity, he was able to get it back and just big pitch, big strikeout. Now he'll deal with Murphy Staley, the Big 12's leading hitter. Strike one from McCullough at 93 miles an hour. Lockett fans on their feet.
Texas led 5-1 in this one, but now down to their final strike here in the ninth after K-State has rallied against the, the leaguer bullpen of the Longhorns. And their ace, Pete Hansen, working his third time through the order against K-State. Cole, a little too much spin on that breaking ball, two and two. A little excited. He hasn't had an opportunity to finish many ball games. So. Good pitcher, but not a lot of complete games as a starter. And just a second time out of the bullpen. He gets the strikeout. Toynton Family Stadium magic again for K State. A second straight top 10 opponent taken down by the Wildcats as they slug their way and pitch their way to the win. And the Wildcats.